Okay, so I'm going to take you through the rhomboids today, and the first thing I want to look at is where do the muscles attach. So the rhomboid minor, the smaller the two muscles, will attach on the medial border of the scapula, and then also attach on this posterior surface. It might be hard to see, but there's a posterior surface here. It's kind of flat that we call the root of the spine of the scapula. So we have the medial border or vertebral border, and then the root of the spine of the scapula that the rhomboid minor will attach to. So the rhomboid minor being the smaller of the two uh, rhomboid muscles uh, also comes over to the SP of C7 and the SP of T1. So taking a look at the fiber direction for the rhomboid minor, you can see that it's a pretty small muscle and the fibers are running like that, so on that angle, okay? Now below the level of the rhomboid minor, we have what's called a rhomboid major. So rhomboid major, again, the fibers are going in the same direction, uh, will attach to the SP of T2 and the SP of T3, T4, and T5. So again, going in the same direction, you can imagine a rhomboid major attaching to the SP of T2, 3, 4, and then all the way down to the SP of T5, all along the medial border or vertebral border. So the rhomboid major will be attaching from the root of the spine of the scapula all the way down to the inferior angle. So based on the muscle's fiber direction, you can kind of get a sense of what the muscle's responsible for. So if this is the starting position, you have a scapula sitting on the rib cage, and the rhomboids concentrically contract and pull the scapula in this direction. So you can see the scapula is sliding or gliding or translating across the rib cage, and we call that a retraction or an adduction of the scapula because the scapula is coming closer to the midline of the body. Okay, so again, starting position, the rhomboids concentrically contract and pull the scapula or the medial board of the scapula closer to the midline or the vertebral border of the scapula. Okay, so then the same muscles, the rhomboids, can also concentrically contract and elevate the scapula. So now the scapula is moving in this direction, so it's still a gliding or translational motion, and the scapula is elevating at what we call the scapulocostal joint. Okay, so then the rhomboids, this is a little harder to see, but imagine bringing your arm overhead, so we'll call that abduction of the arm of the shoulder joint. The scapula also has to move. So when you bring your arm away from the side of your body overhead, okay, we call that abduction of the arm of the shoulder joint, the scapula has to upwardly rotate. So it's going to go in this direction. Okay, so we call that an upward rotation of the scapula at the scapulocostal joint. Now imagine the rhomboids attaching where they attach all along the vertebral border of the scapula. The muscle can shorten to pull the scapula in this direction. So we call that a downward rotation. So you bring your arm overhead and we have an upward rotation of the scapula and then those rhomboids attaching to the vertebral board of the scapula shorten to give you a downward rotation of the scapula. So your arm is now coming closer to the side of your body and that scapula downwardly rotates. Okay, so now imagine the scapula is in this position and those same muscles, the rhomboids, can pull the scapula in this direction. So again, we would call that a downward rotation of the scapula from anatomical position. Now you might be wondering how that occurs. Well, 
If you bring your arm behind your back, so we would call that extension of the arm at the shoulder joint, and then you try to adduct your arm or try to bring your arm closer to the midline of your body, your scapula has to follow the arm in that direction. So we would call that downward rotation of the scapula at the scapulocostal joint. Now the same thing will occur if you bring your body or your arm right out in front of your body just slightly so we have a flexion of the arm at the shoulder joint and then try to bring your arm closer to the midline. That scapula will also downwardly rotate. Okay, So that gives you some indications of what the rhomboids are responsible for when we look at motion of the scapula at the scapulocostal joint. Now the interesting thing about this, and this is really unique for the chain, is that this is really not a joint. So you might have heard me say downward rotation of the scapula at the scapulocostal joint, or elevation of the scapula at the scapulocostal joint, or even retraction or adduction of the scapula, the scapulocostal joint. But technically, this is not a joint. So where does that motion, or where is that motion initiated? Well, if we bring the skeleton around here, now we have, you can see a clavicle attaching to the manubrium. So we have a clavicle attaching to the manubrium, and we call that the sternoclavicular joint. Okay, we call that the sternoclavicular joint. So the clavicle meets the manubrium. We call that the sternoclavicular joint or SC joint. So <clears throat> I'm going to put the clavicle in here, and you're going to see that I have motion of a clavicle in the same directions that we talked about with the scapula. So the clavicle can protract and then it can retract. So remember the scapula was retracting? We have a clavicle on this side of the body that's protracting and then retracting. Okay, So that's going to occur around a vertical axis at what's called the SC joint. So we have an axis that's going in this direction and it is at the SC joint. Okay, So in order to get protraction or retraction of the clavicle at the SC joint, we have to have an axis going in this direction. Okay, So once one more time, you have a clavicle that can protract and retract. Okay. Now going back to what the scapula was doing before, we also have a clavicle that can elevate and we have a clavicle that can depress. So we have an elevation of the clavicle and a depression of the clavicle. At that same joint we call the sternoclavicular joint. Okay. Now the axis for that motion, for elevation and depression, is going to be going in this direction. Okay. So that's a frontal plane motion, whereas when we had the protraction retraction, that would be a transverse plane motion. Okay. The last motion that we talked about, we talked about the rhomboids moving the scapula, is what we call a downward rotation. Now, in order to have a downward rotation of a clavicle, you first have to have an upward rotation. So I'm going to show you the axis first. We have an axis here at what we call the SC joint, and then we have another axis over here that we call the AC joint. So they're going in the same direction, okay? But now we have motion here, and we have motion over here at what's called the AC joint or a chromioclavicular joint. So we have the chromial end of the clavicle meeting the acromion of the scapula. So we have an axis going in this direction running from anterior to posterior and we have an axis over here at the AC joint running in the same direction 
running anterior to posterior. Okay, so now imagine you're bringing your arm overhead, you have a clavicle that's going to elevate at the FC joint, but then as it's elevating, it's going to rotate back. So as it elevates, it rotates, hopefully you can see that back. So we have an elevation of the clavicle, and as it's elevating, it's rotating back. So it's rotating this way. Okay, so you have a clavicle elevating and then rotating back. Okay, so again, it's rotating this way. And the motion of the scapula is occurring over here at the AC joint. So you might remember that you have a scapula that is going like this in order for you to bring your arm overhead and then of course those rhomboids are going to concentrically contract in order to bring the scapula downwardly. So as you bring your arm back to your side that scapula has to rotate downwardly. Okay, So you can see that we really need motion of the clavicle okay, at the SC joint and we need motion of the scapula on the clavicle at the AC joint in order to have motion of the scapula. Okay, that's really, really important. So just something to think about. It's kind of unique. We have a muscle back here on the posterior side of the chain that we are calling the rhomboids and they're running in this direction Okay, and they're capable of moving the scapula, but just understand that this is not a body part that actually moves at a joint. Okay, in order to get motion of this body part, the scapula, we have to have motion at the SC joint, and we have to have motion at the AC joint. Okay, and then just looking at the rhomboids a little deeper, we have same fiber direction, but now we have a muscle, the rhomboids, that's capable of rotating the thoracic spine, the trunk, to the opposite side. That's really, really important. Okay, so we have a muscle attaching all along these little levers here from T1 all the way down to T5 when we look at the thoracic spine it's capable of pulling the trunk to the left at the spinal joints, okay? That same muscle crossing all those spinal joints is capable of extending the trunk at the spinal joints. So you can see the trunk is coming closer to you or the skeleton's coming closer to you. So those rhomboids, even though there's not a lot of motion throughout those segments in that direction are capable of extending the trunk at the spinal joints and rotating the trunk to the opposite side. So you have muscles on this side, the rhomboids, that are contralaterally rotating the trunk at the spinal joints. Okay, So something to think about, the rhomboids are really, really important. You don't see too many people walking around with a retracted scapula, but what you do see is a lot of people walking around with a protracted or adducted scapula, even an elevated scapula. You might even see an upward tilt or even a lateral tilt that we didn't talk about today, but the rhomboids are extremely important for this region. Okay, thanks for joining us.